Hi, welcome to this preview video on my accelerated super learning course. In this course, you are going to learn how to basically supercharge your brain to be able to learn anything fast and effectively. You are going to also learn how to increase your not just reading speed, but your reading comprehension and retention. I have used these methods with students and they've gone from reading very slowly from perhaps only a hundred words a minute and sometimes even below. And some students have gone up to reading to over a thousand words a minute with up to a 95% retention of that information. These techniques are very, very powerful. We are also going to study how to learn anything, how to learn a language, how to learn any subject, any skill you want to learn efficiently and effectively. These tools are so powerful. It's such a shame that we're not taught these from a young age at school, if only we were. So, enroll in this course now to unlock the power of your learning capabilities. In this course, we are going to discover not only the best tools and skills to learn and how to memorize information, how to master that information, we're also going to cover what happens when we get stuck. It happens occasionally. We're going to cover what happens when you get frustrated. We're going to look at many of the misconceptions of correct studying. Concentration, what's that? We're also going to look at how to be able to pass information directly to your subconscious so learning becomes effortless. And then all we need to do is learn how to elicit that information from our minds. Does this sound a little matrix? Well, it's as close as we're going to possibly get to it until we can literally hook ourselves up to a computer. If this sounds interesting to you and you are really motivated and really want to increase your time you spend doing the things you love and hopefully in this course you will also rediscover your innate love of learning that all little children have that unfortunately gets destroyed when going to institutional places to learn incorrectly. So not only will you have more time to enjoy the things you do, you'll relearn how to enjoy learning. We're also going to see, as I said, the misconceptions of learning, what is required in learning for maximal optimization. It's not just a question of learning a few tricks. There are tricks and tools involved, obviously, but it's way more than that. Diet comes into it. Exercise comes to, into it. We have to stimulate the right brain chemicals to be able to maximize our learning efficiency. With that, as I said, using the subconscious not bothering with the conscious mind because the conscious mind has its belief systems. It has its own filtering systems. When we get tired, when we're not that interested in the subject, it will filter out information automatically. And by bypassing this, we can get so much more information into our minds. And then all we have to do is learn to recall that information. So without further ado, Let's get stuck into the course. In the next video, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to who I am. In case you haven't taken any of my other courses, and in case you haven't checked out my profile, I will talk about who I am and how this course came to be. So, let's move on. How did this course come to be? Who am I? 
Well, if you haven't checked out my profile, and if you haven't seen any of my courses, my name is Ashley Deeks. And I'm a person that does, I don't have it, and I'm not it, I do dyslexia and I do ADD. And this in school led me to fail. And because no one knew how to help me, I set out to find out the best things I needed to learn. And not only learn, to control my mind, because with ADD, our minds seem to wander off. And I have discovered many, many, many amazing things along my journey. I have courses on yoga, on meditation, on mindfulness, and all these things will help you learn faster. So if you're interested, go check them out. However, this course is about learning. So as I said, I was at school, I was failing, no one really knew how to help me. I had to set out how to learn for myself. I knew the techniques they were giving me in school just didn't work. By the time I got to university, and by the time I went to university, I ended up, after failing school, I somehow managed to just about get the grades to be able to get into university. But I finished university second in my class. So I went from failing to, you could call it thriving. And that was not the end of my journey. That made me even more interested to find out even more powerful techniques to be able to learn faster, to learn better, to completely master, dominate, and control my own mind. And some of the things I found out were absolutely amazing. And those things we are going to see in this course. You are going to have the tools you need to be able to learn anything you want. Studied at university. I studied after university. I've taken hundreds of courses. I've read thousands of books all in the search to dominate my own mind and learn as best and as optimally as I can. I've also used these techniques for over a decade with students. While I specialize teaching ADD, ADHD kids, I've also taught languages to many students. I've also taught regular students of school age to help them get better grades and to succeed. I have practiced and honed and redefined all the techniques in this course. So if you want to learn another language, if you want to learn a new skill, study better. Perhaps this is for your children. You want to help them learn better. Brilliant, well done. This is not just tools adults can use. Children can use them too. As I said, I've taught children these techniques. I've taught adults these techniques. I've taken dyslexics who couldn't read or could hardly read, as I said, up to well over a thousand words. Yes, dyslexics at a thousand words per minute. It is possible. So don't let anyone say it isn't. These things are just misunderstood. So without further ado, let's get stuck into the course. Are you an effective learner? Do you have a good memory? Is your power of processing as fast as you think it could possibly be? To be able to become an accelerated or super learner, the first things we need to do is recognize 
where we're starting from and build from there. So although we're only in the first major video of this course, we're already going to start with a practice skill. So you can start practicing today and start improving your processing speeds and your memory speeds and your memory retention. Because it doesn't matter where we're starting. It doesn't matter how bad we think our memory is or how slow we think our processing skills are. We all have a seed inside us somewhere. That all we need to do is nurture that seed and it will grow into a great big tree. And that tree then fruits and we turn into a forest. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to do with numbers. Now we all know these abstract things that we use, a one, a two, etc. But the human brain actually doesn't code numbers this way. These are just abstract things we use. The coding the human brain uses for numbers is actually written. We've seen it many, many times. It's actually written on a dice. The numbers we see on die, on dice, are the way our brain codes. So the first exercise that you are going to start doing is you're going to get, perhaps you want to start with one die. That's absolutely fine. Then two and three and four. We've all got board games at home. Go and raid those board games. Get the dice out. It doesn't matter if they're different colors, different sizes. Absolutely not important. And very simply, you're going to start rolling the dice and adding as fast as you can those numbers. Practice. You're going to practice this. Maybe you only do 10 rolls in the morning and 10 rolls in the evening. That is wonderful. And it's actually far better. And sitting down for half an hour and practicing. Because another thing that we are going to learn about speed learning, speed reading, accelerated learning, education, whatever we want to call these things, is spacing our time and not sitting down for hours at a time because that's not effective. Little and often. So start with one die. Two dice, three dice, build up, and very simply roll it, roll the dice, and calculate as fast as you can the number there is. The second exercise, oh, we're already into exercise number two in this video. Yes, we're already into exercise number two in this video, because it's a very, very similar exercise. We're going to get some poker cards, and we're going to do the same thing. The reason we're going to do both is the coding on the cards obviously goes higher. We're going to take the cards from one to 10. We don't need the picture cards. And we're going to do the same thing as with the dice. And we're going to add them. Again, we might start with two cards and then go to three cards and then go to four cards. We start with the dice because they have only the real numbers for coding involved. Then we're going to go to the playing cards because they have not only good coding printed on them, they also have the abstract figures there. So our brains can relate the two. We are going all the way back to basics. And you'll see later in the course in the reading that we're going to go all the way back to individual words to learn how to be able to compute a thousand words possibly, maybe slightly less, maybe slightly more, a minute. Personally, I don't read at a thousand words a minute. I read at just over 600 words a minute. Could I go faster? Well, I could practice and get up to over a thousand words a minute if I wanted to. But I enjoy 600 words a minute. And for the amount of reading I do, 
I'm not studying a law degree where I have to read 15 books a week or whatever. So for the amount of reading I do, for me, 600 words a minute is very enjoyable. And it also means when I want to use this method for a fictional book, I'm not finishing the book in a day. It means I can enjoy it over a weekend. So the speed you go to with your reading is up to you. You can take it as fast as you want. But back to the numbers. So roll the dice, add them up. Maybe 10, maybe 15, up to you. That's it. We then do it in the evening. Once we've done that for a couple of days, or maybe a week, we go to the cards and we start adding cards. Just adding them for now. Maybe it's one card. Just looking at it and saying the number as quickly as possible. Then two cards, adding them. Three cards, adding them. Four cards, adding them. Five cards, adding them. And get our processing our brain processing speeds faster, quickly. This isn't going to take much practice if we start a good habit today of frequent and often practicing these things. Once you've been practicing these for a couple of days, move on to the next video. Perhaps you're the type of person that likes to get all the information right at the very beginning and then go back and review the course and start the exercises. That's absolutely fine too. So you can see where we're going before actually doing it. That's absolutely fine. If you're the type of person that likes to go step by step and conquer every step first, do that. Stop watching the course, practice this for a week, and then come back. That's up to you. There are no strict rules apart from you know yourself best. So in the previous video, we looked at computing speeds of our brain. But the other thing I mentioned was, how good is our memory retention? Well, this is the next skill. Before we even look at any of the theory, we're gonna get going. We've already started with the dice. We've already started counting the cards, adding them together. Now we're gonna start another skill. This is, again, with the poker cards, you're going to lay out, start with laying out five cards. Memorize what they are. Memorize the number of the cards, the color of the cards, and the suit of the cards. And when you have them, turn them over, and then see if you can remember them. Now I say start with five. If you find five difficult, absolutely fine. A lot of people do. Go down to three. Start with three. Once you can do three, go to four, back to five. Once you can do the five, go to six, go to seven, go to eight, go to nine, go to 10, all laid out, just trying to remember them. A little tip here, don't make the lines longer than five. Start a new line. Why is this? Because our brains sequence things and most people can sequence in seven plus or minus two. So the average sequencing that we can do is from five up to nine, somewhere in there. So if we stay at the low end of five for this exercise, it's going to make it easier. Now these sequences, let's just clarify these sequences. What is the sequence that we can do? Well, think of a list a list of brands, a list of cars, a list of colors, a list of animals. 
and where you pause, that first little breath, that first little stop, that is how you can sequence. It's where you sequence up to, whether it's in fives, whether it's in sevens. Obviously, this is another little skill we can already start practicing by creating lists and extending our sequencing. This will all be beneficial later on. These are all just little primer exercises before we get into any theory that you can start practicing today in case you don't have time or you don't wish to do all the course in one go. You've got the dice. You've got the adding the cards. You've got the memorizing the cards. In fives, in threes, in sevens. And I'm even going to give you another exercise to do right now before we get in to any of the theory. Again, staying with the cards, you're going to look at a card and put it on the table. Look at another card, place it on top. Look at another card, place it on top. Again, similar to the previous exercise, start with five. Once you've got the five, put the deck down, pick up those cards turned over, and recite from memory the number, the colour, and the suit. As fast as you can. So we already have some very powerful exercises in memory retention and in processing speeds. These are great little precursor exercises to everything else we're going to do. Just starting to stimulate your brains and speed them up. So I hope by now you've at least gone and thought in your head where I can find those dice in my house. Or if not, which shop I can go and buy them in. Perhaps you've already been practicing for a week or two before you've even got to this video. Those exercises, depending on the style of person you are. Whichever it is, that's great. Now we're going to start. Whilst you are practicing these things, we're going to look at a little bit of theory and some of the greatest misconceptions and silly mistakes we make when learning. The first one is the biggest. Now, I have seen in so many realms of life, whether it's personal transformation, whether it's learning something, whether it's making money, whether it's whatever it is, all these secrets to success, they all start with Think of your goal, write it down. Okay. Goals are all well and good, but they're not. Huh? Am I saying we shouldn't have goals to achieve what we want to get? How are we going to achieve Reading, for example, a thousand words a minute if we don't have a goal of reading to a thousand words a minute. Well, like I said, I never got to a thousand words a minute because I got to 600 words a minute. And for me, I felt that was enough. The only thing I wanted to do was increase my speed and enjoy what I'm doing. So forget those goals. This course, we're not going to write down any goals. It's a big, big, big misconception. What we want to do in this course, as I have said previously, is learn to love learning. Now, if we're always trying to attain something by getting the, the straight A, by successfully 
learning a new language? Well, when have you learnt the language? You can always learn more words in a language. You can always better your spelling in a language. You can always increase your vocabulary in a language. Perfection doesn't exist. The goal need not exist. If you're at medical school, if you're at, l- at law school and you want to become a better lawyer, you're never going to stop learning. You can never be the best doctor there is. You can always get better. And if you love learning and you learn to learn because this is what you love to do, this is how you are going to be able to help yourself and maximise your learning ability. No goals. We don't want to attain anything. And we don't want to avert anything. Maybe we're failing. Failing school. Or we're in trouble with our boss because we haven't learnt that language yet. So we're learning to run away from these things. Again, they are going to hinder your brain. Your subconscious mind doesn't like goals. It doesn't like to get to something. It doesn't like to get away from something. Life is about living in the present and enjoying the present moment. It's not about what we did in the past. It's not about what we're going to do in the future. If we learn to enjoy what we're doing in the present moment, we're going to be far more successful in life. That is the first misconception of life, living and learning. Let's learn a few tricks, a few skills, a few tools, and then we're going to become advanced super learners. We have to learn how to optimise ourselves to optimise our learning. How do we optimise ourselves? Well, we have to optimise our productivity. How do we optimise our productivity? Surely we optimise our productivity by just steaming ahead Obviously, he's already said we don't need any goals, so we just steam ahead and go, 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 go. And that is how we increase our productivity and optimise our productivity. No. In the present moment, starts each day, the present moment when we wake up. So becoming optimal in our productivity, in our ability to learn, starts with when we wake up. When we wake up, first of all, Don't lie around in bed. Wake up at the time you need to get up. So if you have an alarm, that's fine. If you wake up early, you wake up early and you can stay in bed till the alarm. Or you can think, right, my brain's woken me up for some reason right now. Time to get up and get going. Which of these two methods you use is up to you. Because perhaps you were studying late. Perhaps you have a baby in the house and your baby was crying till three o'clock in the morning and you got woken up at six o'clock in the morning. You can't be productive on three hours sleep. And when it comes to learning, it's just not going to happen. So be reasonable here. But if you have an alarm time to get up, that is when you must get up. No lions. You hear that alarm, or you wake up at the time you need to get up. Five, four, three, two, one, get out of bed. Literally count. Five, four, three, two, one, out of bed. Once you're out of bed, either make your bed or fold your bed to prepare it so it can be aired, which is healthy to do. Why do this? Because it starts 
the organizational process. It gets us in that organizational mindset. As soon as we got up, make the bed or better, fold the bed in a neat way to air the bed. Now here, when we get up, we want to actually do a little bit of stretching or a little bit of exercise. Now exercise is very important when it comes to learning. And I'm not saying we've got to get out of bed and then hit the gym because it might not fit into our schedule. If you can first thing in the morning, go for a five kilometer run or whatever the exercise you like to do is, more on that later. But some stretching as soon as we wake up, just as any animals you'll see in nature when they wake up, they do a little bit of stretching. So the best way to do this, you're still in your bedroom, do a little bit of stretching. How can we do a little bit of stretching? Well, yoga, the yoga postures, the sun salutation, or similar to a slow motion burpee. Stretch out, like warming up for before doing exercise, stretch out your hamstrings, stretch out your quads, stretch out your back. Many stretching exercises we can do. Pick your favorite ones. Doesn't take long, maybe a minute, Two minutes, those two minutes you would have stayed in bed before you counted the three, two, one after your alarm went off. But we're out of bed, so we take advantage of that minute, two minutes, do that little bit of stretching. And then it's time for some quiet time. Yeah, but I live in a student house and there are 10 other people and there's loads of noise being made. I've got kids. I've got three kids that I have to get up, I have to get them to school, I have to... That's not viable. Well, perhaps we want to set that alarm five, ten minutes earlier from now on. So we get out of bed immediately, we do that minute or two of stretching, and then perhaps we go and make a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, get a juice, glass of water, Sit down, again, two or three minutes. Thinking about what we're going to do that day to be productive. This is very important to prepare ourselves for the day to be productive. To stimulate the right mindset for the day. If we've got class, think what classes we've got. Think what we need to have to study for those classes. Think about what we're going to be studying in those classes. Perhaps it's going to work. Perhaps it's, I've got to do the washing. I've got to get the kids to school. I've got to change the baby. I've got to walk the dogs. That's whatever it is, get in the right mindset. This is all very important stuff to optimise our brains. We haven't even got on to the real learning stage. This is still all setting up right. So have that cup of tea, have that cup of coffee. Perhaps you have children, your children are already awake. Downstairs, if you go downstairs or you've got dogs and the dogs are going to bombard you, that's fine. Sit on your bed without the drink or Get a glass of water from the bathroom. Just sit there for two or three minutes and contemplate the day so you can start getting in the right frame of mind. Everybody's situation is different, so figure out how you can do this. Whilst we're talking about optimizing our brains, our bodies, even pre-learning, we need to look at diet, possibly supplementation and exercise. Breakfast, obviously, we all know it's the most important of the meal of the day. Make sure you get a good, healthy breakfast. A good, healthy breakfast to increase concentration, to increase learning abilities does not mean a bowl of sugar cereal or a slice of toast. 
we know a balanced diet has a balance of proteins, of vitamins and minerals, of fats, and a little bit of carbohydrate. Everybody eats too much carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are not good for concentration. Carbohydrates break down into sugars. Sugars create peaks and troughs in your blood sugar levels. They create peaks and troughs in your concentration levels and your stress levels. So, breakfast, protein, veg, fruit, nuts, seeds, a good healthy breakfast. We all know it. A lot of people don't do it. If you change your eating habits today or finish the last packet of sugar cereal you had, don't buy them again. Breakfast, lunch, supper. Get all the nutrients in balance in all those meals. Ideally, if you can have two snacks as well, great. If we don't start off with a good meal or we don't have a good lunch, we tend to snack later. And those snacks tend to be unhealthy snacks. They tend to be carbohydrate orientated or fast foods. Or we have too many cups of coffee because we start to fade. Healthy meals, three, five a day, very important. Supplementation. If we're not getting all the vitamins and minerals, all the healthy fats we need from our diet, then take a multivitamin. Take some omegas, very good for the memory. Make sure we have the optimal, optimal nutrition. Yes, healthy fats are very, very important for memory and concentration. I mentioned the omegas. The omega-3, the omega-6, can be the omega-9. We've got the vitamins, the Bs, the Ks, all of those. So if in doubt, we can take some supplements. Ideally, we get everything from our food, but if not, take the supplements. Exercise. We are going to look a little bit later about brain chemicals. I'm going to briefly mention them here. We study best when we're happy. We study best when we're enjoying ourselves. So we need to produce those brain chemicals, the endorphins, the serotonin, the oxytocin, the dopamine, these happy chemicals. How do we produce these? Well, one of the best ways, especially with the endorphins, and the easiest ways to produce these is through exercise. Now, if I go for a 5K run every morning, I'm actually not going to be producing those endorphins for very long because our bodies get used to doing things very, very quickly. We need to do for maximum stimulation of endorphins. And this is vitally important for ADDs, ADHDs, dyslexics, because our brains work slightly differently and that it is slightly harder for our brains to produce these chemicals than constantly varied high intensity exercise every single day. This can be HIT high intensity interval training. This can be lifting weights, power lifting, Olympic lifting. This can be an intense martial art. This can be boxing. This can be sprint training. It can be running, but don't run a 5K every day. One day run a 1K, another day run a 12K, another day run a 5K, another day 2K. Every day chain it up. Do hill running, uphill running, downhill running. Everything, every day changes. We do it differently every day. Very, very important for this endorphin stimulation. It will also help with the serotonin levels and the dopamine levels because we're going to be reducing stress by doing these good exercises and therefore lets our bodies produce these beneficial chemicals more. 
So diet, if need be supplementation, and exercise. So important. Of course, the other thing to work optimally is sleep. Well, I only have time for six hours sleep a night. Some people's situations, they do only have time for six hours. Some people think they only need six hours. Optimally, eight or nine hours. We all know this. Get it. If you can't, have a siesta, a nap, a very quiet time in the middle of the day after lunch to help increase brain function and therefore learning capabilities. We have to be realistic when doing this. I'm not going to say be perfect in everything because it just doesn't exist. I've seen courses that say do this, 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 and then you'll do it. No, adapt to the way your life works. So you can be in the present moment, you can be optimally working as best you possibly can, and then over time, try and correct these things. If you only get six hours sleep a night, analyze why. Perhaps, as I said, you have young children, you have a baby, it's impossible to get more than that. You might even not get that. Fine. Those kids get older, then you can go back to getting more sleep. Perhaps you're a student and have so much work on, well, that is better organisation. So, analyse your schedule, how you work, plan it out, Look at your meal times. Make sure you stick to good, healthy times. Organize when you exercise during the day. Great in the morning, but doesn't have to be. Stretching is important. Get your life in order. Manage your time. The more your time is organized and managed, the more you can live in the present moment, the more effective and efficient you can be, the lower your stress levels are going to be. These are the key initial points. You are never going to learn optimally if you're not doing these things. Learning optimally, super learning, accelerated learning is not about a couple of tools. Oh, well, I do this when I'm learning and everything changes. No, change your entire lifestyle. Optimize it. Now, as I've said, I've taken many courses, I've studied this, I've practiced this for well over a decade. One of the common things I hear is about your learning environment. It must be clean, it must be tidy, there must be no distractions. Yeah. Hmm. Let's face it, is this realistic? Is it even true? Well, if you look at ADDs, it's actually been shown that whilst they're not very good at sitting down and studying from a book, sitting at a table, they are extremely efficient at picking up information from their surroundings. So for example, if they have posters, all around the room of the information they need to learn, the room they are in most, they are going to be able to pick up so much of that information. Yes, pick up that information subconsciously or because they're frequently looking at it and they can learn off the information around their rooms up to 80% of the information they need to learn. So it's not about necessary being neat and tidy. It's not even necessarily about having a quiet place to work. It's about being in the present moment and being quiet inside yourself. How many people study in a classroom with lots of other people? How many people work in an office with lots of noise and everything around them? How many people who work from home actually go and work in a cafe 
with noise and stimulation around them. Why do people do this? If the optimal place for working, for studying, is in peace and quiet. Now, if I sit in a perfectly clean and tidy room, or I go to a super quiet library to study, I actually find it very frustrating. I can study, I can work far better, perhaps sitting in a cafe, being quiet and peaceful within myself, not going to see the environment. That is the optimal learning state. It's not about the external environment. It's about the internal environment. Being tidy, being untidy. Oh, being tidy, you're going to be able to study more. No. Being organized, you're going to be able to study more. People think these two things are the same. They're not. I study. I work efficiently. Many people study and work efficiently. And many of you will work and study efficiently in untidiness. But if you are organized in your untidiness, what do I mean by this? My office, my desk where I work is a mess. It's strewn about, there are papers everywhere, etc. However, when I go to look for something, I know exactly where it is. I am organized in untidiness. If I tidy everything up, I can't find anything. So how is being neat and tidy optimal for my learning? I find if I am studying a topic and I have five books open in front of me, I can quickly go and find what I need on that table rather than a nice neat pile on the table and having to constantly open and close the book and use page markers and everything we're told to be neat and tidy for optimal learning. It's just not true. We have to be optimally organized within us. The environment isn't as important. Now, if you are the type of person that needs tidiness to be organized, then obviously for you, having a nice, tidy, clean environment is going to be optimal for your learning. Know who you are. There is not one secret method. Tidiness means organization, means optimal. Mess is bad. It's not that way. How we are comfortable within ourselves. Nature is not neat and tidy. You go into a wood, you don't find nice neat rows unless humans have planted it. You find a tree here, a different tree there, a plant there, an animal here. It's all around itself, but it is organized in the most efficient and effective way in that system. Think about that. Nature, evolution, is at its optimal place or the most optimal place it can be at that time. It's not neat and tidy. Humans have evolved in that. It's only very recently have we taken ourselves out of the nature out of nature's environment and created nice, neat, clean tables and blah, 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 blah. So it's not true that that is going to create our optimal environment. Have I made this clear? If you go out into the forest, does your brain get in a big haze and stressed? And, or when you go for a walk in the woods with all that untidiness around you, do you actually find yourself at peace? So use this knowledge to be at peace, to be in the now, to be an optimal learner, to be able to do accelerated learning and super learning. Think about these things. Think about the type of person you are and use it.
However, of course, with this said about our environment, one thing is true, and that is about distractions. When we want to study, mobile phones, iPads, televisions, radio, anything that we are not using to study with is a distraction. We all know Facebook and all these other apps that we're constantly connected with. They are major distractions. Going and getting cups of tea, cups of coffee, something to eat because we haven't been eating properly are all distractions and delay the process. Because when we get into it, when we want to super focus, to super learn, we cannot have these distractions. Now, another important thing we must also pay attention to is the lighting we are using. Obviously, the temperature we're using too, if we're trying to study in 40 degree weather sitting by the beach, it's not going to happen. 20 degree weather by the beach might be the best place to study, as long as there's not sand blowing on us, or sitting by a pool. All these things can be great places as long as we don't have people jumping on us, splashing us, distracting us. If we have animals around, make sure they're calm and they're walked before we want to sit down and study, or they can be distractions. There's a big difference between a calm environment interiorly and a calm environment exteriorly. Lighting helps us with our visual sense to be calm. So the typical fluorescent lights you get in a library are not calming lights. Natural sunlight is obviously the best light we can study by. But a lot of the time we're studying when it's dark at night. So make sure you have some good daylight quality bulbs, which means 5,000, 5,500 Kelvin or more. LEDs tend to work well for some people. Maybe they like the cool lights, the white lights, or they like the warm lights, the yellow lights. So test all of them and find which you find is more calm for you, which you find less frustrating, which cause less visual stress. All these little subtleties are going to help you a long way when we're sitting down for learning. So the previous strategies we've talked about, long-term productivity, daily productivity, helping find an inner peace, an inner calm to be able to relax, getting rid of the distractions, but not necessarily the mess if we're organized within it. All these things are going to go a long way to help you learn optimally. Stress. Is it good for learning? Last minute cramming. Before exams. Right before exams. Are these good things for learning? Will these techniques that we're going to look at further in this course work for cramming for an exam? Yes, they will work for cramming for an exam. They will help you learn to cram information. But it's not going to create a super learning, accelerated learning optimal environment. Nerves cannot help us learn. Stress puts us in the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight mode. We can't learn in this state. It's not a good state to learn in. To learn optimally, we need our autonomic nervous system to be in the parasympathetic nervous system, which means calm, relaxed, at rest. So cramming, studying when we're super tired, all these things aren't going to help. Spacing things out over time, 
These are very general things. Everybody knows them. But if you want to be a super learner, if you want to accelerate your learning, be optimal, then these common things are true. Spacing things out, little and often, not sitting down for a two hour study session, 20 minutes, take a planned break, get a planned cup of coffee, that's absolutely fine. But don't go and get a cup of coffee before I start, before, 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 no. We have our times planned out, we're calm inside, we know when we're gonna get the coffee, at the time, we know when we're gonna take the break, we've got the right lighting set up, we're calm inside us, this will all improve concentration. But okay, we're learning this stuff. But I'm a student and I've got an exam. And I always get nervous before exams and then I forget everything I've learned. And so what's the point in learning this if I have problems with exams? Well, let's cover this now and here. Nerves. Nerves and the butterflies in our tummy. Some people are very good at being very calm before exams. They get to the exam hall and then they get nervous because of everybody around them. Well, the good news is we can learn to use these nerves and these butterflies to our advantage and stimulate our brains to get into action because these nerves do create the fight or flight. In the fight or flight, we're very good at getting the information we've mastered. So if you've half learned the information, it's not gonna help you. But if you fully know the information, then these nerves, this butterfly feeling in your tummy that you can get will help you. So embrace it. If you haven't fully mastered the information, let's face it, most people don't fully master the information before an exam. The trick is to accept the nerves, to welcome them, to expand them, to make them bigger and bigger and bigger until they actually go away. Now, whilst you're chatting to your friends, this isn't gonna help. So you need to sit down quietly and accept them. Or even when you're sitting at the desk ready for the exam, or if it's a driving exam when you're in the car, when you sit in front of that steering wheel, that's when you let those feelings wash over you, become so big, as big as you, as big as the car, as big as the world, as big as the planet, until they become ridiculously big and disappear. This should not be a problem using this system, because using this system, you're far more likely to master the information anyway. So you can just use that to your advantage in your fight and flight with the nerves to get the information out. But it's just a little thing to bear in mind when we need to get the information out of us. The positive brain. The positive brain, what do I mean? I mean a happy state, a state of enjoyment, a state of contentment, of blissfulness. We need our brains to be in a positive mindset to be able to optimise our learning capabilities. Now, we already talked about how to stimulate endorphins, and that is through regular exercise of constantly varied types and very intense. This will produce a good amount of endorphins. Obviously, the other things we need with the positive brain are to be motivated to do what we're doing. Because it doesn't matter how much we try to study something we don't like or find boring. It's a thousand times more difficult than to study something we enjoy. So how can we turn something that we don't particularly enjoy studying into something we enjoy studying? Well, at the very basic level, 
We can literally lie to ourselves. If we lie to ourselves for long enough, our belief systems change. And then we actually start enjoying them. This is how our subconscious mind works. So we mentioned the endorphins. And previously I mentioned oxytocin, serotonin, and dopamine. How can we stimulate these chemicals? Well, oxytocin is what they call the love chemical. So if you are not just motivated, you literally have a love for what you're doing, you're going to start creating oxytocin. If you are in love with someone, you can focus those feelings towards what you're doing at hand. Dopamine and serotonin, how do we stimulate these? Well, dopamine simply by being happy, having a good laugh. When we're doing this, concentrate on exactly how we're feeling and try and figure out how to replicate those feelings. Now we can also use brainwave stimulation, something we're going to talk about later, to help you stimulate these things going through different frequency levels. But this actually gets very, very, very complicated. So it's far easier just to learn to love, to decide to love what you're doing, or in this case, learning. Now this might sound very silly oh, I'm going to lie to myself and pretend I love what I'm doing. But it works. When you're doing something you love to do, time flies. And when you're doing something you love to learn, not only do you have a better time, you do learn it better. So remember, before you sit down, to study, to learn, whatever you want to learn. And I say sit down lightly because you might be walking around. You might even be jumping on a trampoline. We'll get to that later. But when it's your time to study, make sure you get your brain into a positive mindset. It will be far more beneficial to take Five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, not procrastinating. Because if you're procrastinating, it means you lack motivation to do something. So you want to have five, 10, 15 minutes before your study time. Again, where you can sit down quietly, like we said at the beginning of the day, think about what you're going to do, how you're going to break it up, and find the enjoyment or lie to yourself saying this is going to be fun and get that motivation and get that positive mindset. This will help you optimize your learning greatly. Obviously, it's better to actually enjoy it than to lie to yourself. But as I said, if you lie to yourself, that constant lying will change your filters, change your beliefs, and it will eventually work. So have a go at this. If you're finding that difficult, the other thing you can do is think of a subject you love. And then think of the subject that you're studying that you don't love right now. Now here's a little trick. Close your eyes. Think of the subject you love. Locate it. Where is that feeling? Is it within you? Is it in front of you? Is it above you? Where, where exactly are these sensations coming from? And now think about the subject that you don't find as nice. Where's that? you'll find it's in a different place. The things you enjoy tend to be in front of you and the things you don't enjoy tend to be behind you. But it's not always the case with everyone. So concentrate on those feelings. 
when you found them, take the one you don't enjoy and move it to the place where the one you do enjoy is and fix it there. Check the feelings that are coming out of it. Check the colours. If you're seeing an image, if necessary, make them brighter, make them more fun, make them more enjoyable and fix it there with the bright colours, the positive feelings to it and open your eyes. Think about now how the feeling of that subject has changed. This is just a little neurolinguistic trick to help you change your filters about something. So in the last video, we talked about the positive brain. And I also mentioned procrastination. And I said procrastination is the opposite of motivation. Well, it is. So if you procrastinate before you start to do something, it's because you don't have enough motivation. Again, repeating the same process as before about with a positive brain. Think about something you're really motivated about and copy those feelings and sensations and the images that creates and put it onto the task at hand to help you become motivated. If, for example, you are going to learn a new language and the whole idea is just so vast, then obviously it's harder to be motivated about it. So we're going to split whatever we're doing into little chunks because it's far easier to be motivated doing little things like we've talked about before, little and often. So you separate the things out into little pieces. You do that little piece, you're done. You take a break, you relax a bit, then you go on to the next one. And if we chip away like this, it actually becomes far easier to stay motivated. When we're studying, we also want to make sure we're having fun. But I'm learning something. How can that be fun? Well, as I said, little kids love to learn things. They love the enjoyment. They love investigating. They love asking questions about things. So perhaps instead of learning something in the regular ways, how about investigating? You might think it's a bit of a waste of time, but how about investigating on Google? See the interesting facts you can find out about what you're doing. Because these all these things you're learning, these little bits, will all tie in later. Because you'll find, we'll talk about later, to learn something new is far easier to build on the knowledge you already have. So if we have a couple of abstract pieces of information that have stuck in our minds about the task at hand, it's going to be far easier to link in the things later. Use fun exercises, do fun activities whilst doing things. Now I mentioned jumping on a trampoline. If you enjoy jumping on a trampoline, then if you're having to, for example, learn new vocabulary, we're going to look at how to learn vocabulary later in the course. But if you're just trying to revise the vocabulary in your head just to check it's still there, jump on a trampoline whilst you're revising it. Go for a walk in the woods. Go for a walk in the park. Make things as fun as you possibly can. Hell, you might even want to do it standing on your head. If standing in your head is fun for you. When you're doing your exercise, you could be thinking about the things you've just seen and combining the two processes together, breaking things up, making things so smaller will increase motivation and if we take the time and effort to make it fun too it's going to help greatly so have a think about what you find motivating what you find fun little activities that you can do they might be silly things you might feel ridiculous doing them 
doesn't matter. If it helps you learn, it helps you learn. So have a think about it. Write them down, make a note of them so you know what they are. And so then you have a list of them. And when you have the things you want to learn, you can say, well, this will go well with doing this. So I'm going to do it in this way. When we are learning something, the brain needs time to process the information. Now, how long does it need to process the information? Well, we all know we have short-term memory, medium-term memory, and long-term memory. So if we sit down to learn something, then it automatically goes to our short-term memory, doesn't it? And then, if we repeat what we're doing, it goes to our long-term memory. After several stages of practicing and practicing and practicing through our medium-term memory. Yet, there's sometimes that we get told something once and it goes straight to our long-term memory. So whilst many, many courses teach you have to process short term, going to medium term, and then going to long term. Let's think about those times that the information has gone directly into your long term memory. Now, I'm not saying that repeating stuff isn't good practice. Because it is good practice. Because even though we can put something straight into our long-term memory, we also have what is called a recall process. So if we put something into our long-term memory and then we don't practice recalling it, it can actually become hard to find. It's there, but it becomes harder to find. So there are couple of things we have to look at here. So, first of all, how can we process something immediately to go into our long-term memory? Well, there are several factors at play here. Again, I've seen many courses that teach tricks and tools, which are very important to do this, yet they forget to mention the states we're in when we do this. Do we learn things and pass them to long-term memory immediately if we're bored? If we're not having fun? No. There are several ways things can be processed into our unconscious long-term memory very quickly. And they stay long-term. How does someone develop a fear or a phobia of something? Well, this is when you're in an awareness state, perhaps you've just woken up, or the typical you're in the shower and a spider jumps on your head. You're relaxing and then you suddenly have this shock. And it's this shock that drives this information straight into your long-term memory. There are, in fact, top pianists in the world who use shock therapy to help them learn the new music they're playing. Now, I'm not recommending this because what they do is they will shove their hands into ice cold water and then play a bit and then shove their hands into ice cold water again and play a bit more. And this shock helps their memory. It is very effective, but I'm not saying we all need to get ice buckets next to where we're learning and keep shoving our hands into water. But what are the other ways things go into long-term memory? Your favourite movie. If you think about it, you can probably actually recall most of the things that went in that movie. But yet, you might have only watched it once. 
possibly twice. So what state were you in? Were you relaxed? Were you in a state of concentration, open awareness? You probably were. So to pass things into long-term memory, first of all, we need to be in the right state of mind. We need to be in a calm state, a concentrated state. We've already talked about how to concentrate correctly. We need to be hearing everything rather than listening to one thing in concrete. We need to be possibly paying attention to what we're doing, but visually aware of everything we're going on around us. And this is the first thing we need to do to be able to pass things into the long-term memory. Then, there are techniques, tricks, tools we can use, which we'll see in later videos, to apply when we're in this state. Now, the other thing I said was, not necessarily implanting the information, but recalling the information. It's learning to process the information, not processing it necessarily putting it in, but processing it, taking it out. So therefore, when we want to process taking the information out and checking we have all the information we need, those key words possibly, depending on what we're learning. And so how do we practice this? Well, it's very simple, very, very simple. We literally have to think about what it is we want to remember. Now, again, when we want to think about these things, we also need to be in this concentrated state. So it's not when we're rushing first in the morning, oh, let's think about everything I studied last night and see if it's all there. No. Perhaps it's first thing in the morning. But then, as we said about organising the day, you sit down calmly with your cup of coffee and you meditate, not meditate as a meditation, meditate as in think about what it is we study. And then, as I said, with techniques that we're going to use, we can check to see whether all the information is there. But so however we look at it, if we want to process slowly, because that's the way we like to do it, repeating, learning, 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 or putting it in first time and practicing recall, the brain does need time to process this information. And another little trick is if we're thinking about something right before we fall asleep, our mind tends to dream about these things. So as we're falling asleep, if you can visualize, not think about with that little voice in your head, because that's going to keep you awake. But if we can visualize, again, using the techniques we're going to see later, the information as we're falling asleep, our brain will process a lot of this information for us. And then with that calm cup of coffee in the morning, we can check whether it's there. So what are the times? What's the timing for processing? Whether it's input processing or output processing, it doesn't matter. There are many, many rules of thumb with processing information. The one I find works best for most people is a very, very simple rule of thumb. It's called the 1-1-1-1 rule. And this is, you check one hour after you supposedly learned something. If it's all there, you check it one day later. If it's all there, you check it one week later. And if it's all there, you check it a month later. If, for example, at the week, you find there's some information missing, 
Well, you go back, you get the information, and then you go back to the hour and to the day until you find all the information's there. So obviously, when thinking about processing information, cramming doesn't work. Cramming is not a way to learn. Learning takes time. As I've said previously, little and often. Why little and often? Well, how has the human mind evolved over the thousands of years? Has it evolved by people sitting at a desk studying for hours on end? Or does the human mind learn over a repeated process? So does the child brain learn when it's in the woods with the parents hunting? Which are the dangerous flowers? Which are the dangerous plants? And do they get told it many, many times? And it's two seconds of attention here, five seconds of attention here. Or is it constant? The human mind processes little and often far better than the typical way the humans have been taught to learn. So again, bear this in mind. When studying, I've said it before and I'm going to be saying it again, little and often. Two minutes of solid focus on material can be far, far, far more effective than sitting down to 40 minutes when you have developed the right tools to do this, which we'll see later in the course. So I just mentioned in the previous video to meditate on it, but not meditation. Meditate, or to reflect on something, to sit in a relaxed, comfortable state, bringing the subject into our awareness, playing around with it, putting pieces in their places. Now, for some people, putting things in their places, if you're an analytical learner, you prefer to learn analytically, although Again, as we're going to see later in the course, it's not the best way to learn. But if you're used to learning analytically, then you'll want to put things in lineal order. It's far more powerful to think intuitively, and so therefore we might not necessarily need to put things in a lineal order. We will need to bring the more important things to the front, put the less important things slightly further behind, maybe slightly up, higher up so we can see them. And we just need to sit calmly without all the books and things in front of us or what we're trying to learn and just reflect on it. So let's look at another example of this. Let's say you're learning a language. How would you meditate and reflect on what you've learned of the language? Well, again, it's a very simple thing to do. When you're calm and relaxed, or when you've got some dead time. Now, when I say dead time, you could be in the bank, waiting in line. You could be on the train to work. You could be, I don't know, hoovering your house. Something that doesn't require attention. And then, for example, if you are learning French or Spanish or whatever language it is, just try to use the words or the language you have used in your study and just try and bring them into focus. Now, if you're at a very, very basic level, that would mean thinking about the words. 
So let's say you just learnt the word car in Spanish. Coche. You're at a very, very basic level, so you can't really make a sentence yet. But you could think, coche. Si, a coche. Coche, rojo. Dos coches rojos. Two red cars. So it's not necessarily trying to create full sentences. It's just trying to place and play with the information you have learned up to the point. Because that will help tremendously. Now, for example, I said dos coches rojos. Perhaps you haven't got that far and you don't know that rojo comes after coche in Spanish. So you might say rojo coche. Dos rojos coche. Now, whilst this is not technically correct in Spanish, it doesn't matter. You're playing around with three words that you have learned. And you could even think about it and see how it sounds and see what it looks like. And over time by doing this, and when someone corrects you and says, no, red goes after car, then you can replay around with it. Now, we're not talking about car, coche. We're not talking about translating the words directly. If we want to translate, again, in language learning, many people say, you must not translate. Now, this just isn't true. Again, we'll talk about this a bit later. But we do need, if we want to translate things, we want to train our brains to go through a third step. So we would say car, from the word car in English, we would see a picture of a car, and from there we would elicit the word coche. So it's not a direct translation word for word. It's a translation via an image. So when we want to generate recall memory for things, it is talking about sitting down, meditating, reflecting on the information we have, playing around with it, placing things in different places, finding a structure in our brain. This might seem very bizarre to some people, but it's much simpler than one thinks it is. We just have to get used to it. And we have to practice recalling the information, checking that we've got it right, and reflecting on it. Okay, now we're going to start getting a little bit more technical. I've talked about concentration, I've talked about being in a good, relaxed, aware state. And we have to be in these states to learn optimally. What am I really talking about, though? Well, our brain emits certain brain waves when our brain is doing certain processes. So we have, at the very low level, when we're sleeping, our brain emits delta waves. And this is very good for processing information on a symbolic level. But yet it's not necessarily the best for learning. The theta waves are a very deep meditative state, or that time when we're between waking and sleeping. And this level of brainwave is again a deep processing state where we can become conscious of many things. And it can be a very good state to process information, to meditate on the information we already have in our minds. Now the delta state uses mainly feelings and emotions. If we go slightly higher up towards 
the next stage of the alpha state. Visual imagery can also come into play, visualization in our brains. So if we can be deeply calm and deeply relaxed in a delta state, when we want to process information and think about it, because we're not using that conscious voice in our heads at these levels, it can be very, very powerful. But can we just pop in and pop out of the delta state? Well, you can if you've learned to master each state. And I teach this in my meditation course. So if you're interested in mastering each state individually, then by all means, go and take my meditation course. However, that deep state does take practice to get into, even if we're using certain technologies that I'll talk about later to get into it. It still takes five or ten minutes to get there. So we're not going to go into it, check we've got it, come out again, because the getting in and getting out is going to take so long. So it's not we learn something and then we go de delta and then we process and then we come out. But it is very good when we are not learning things, when we want to meditate on the information, to visualize it, to get feelings and emotions joined into those images. Getting feelings and emotions joined into those images. Yes, because think of a memory. That memory had emotions and feelings connected to it, didn't it? Feelings and emotions are very powerful connectors. So if we can connect memories, feelings, emotions together, they become far more powerful. And if we're in a delta state whilst we're doing this, it's going to become even more powerful. Beyond the delta state is the alpha state. Now the alpha state is what is generally known as the learning state. This is a highly relaxed state when our ears are open, we're hearing everything. This might start to ring a bell, hopefully it does. Our eyes are not hyper-focused on one point, but they're generally relaxed, processing all the information around us. And our brain automatically goes into the alpha state. The alpha state, again, is not a linguistical state. So that little voice in our heads isn't in the alpha state. The alpha state is a visual processing state. So therefore, again, using techniques that we're going to see later, visual techniques, if we're learning visually, and what most people forget to mention, when we're in this alpha state, it is a highly, highly productive state to be learning in. After the alpha state comes the better state. Now the better state is generally related to our general waking state, where that little voice in our head is going nuts and we're talking to ourselves and analytical learners tend to use that little voice in their head to talk to themselves and process the information. They have to repeat it many, 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 many times and walk around. And not the best state to be in, to learn. For a lot of things, it's not the best state to be in. But it is the one culturally where we have been taught to spend most of our time. Then above the better state, we then go to the gamma states. Now, the gamma states have a very wide frequency. They're the least studied so far in today's technologies. But the gamma waves are known to control 
all the other states. So in the gamma state, we are able to process very, very quickly because they're very high frequencies. We can process feelings and emotions, symbology, visual and linguistical or verbal information. So whilst the alpha state is known as the learning state, and it is a very effective learning state, surely if we can be learning at certain frequencies in gamma states where we're controlling all of our senses at the same time, isn't this where we want to be? To become a super learner? Now we do want to become a relax when we do this. The gamma states are known as the hyperstates. But hyper doesn't necessarily mean hyperactivity bouncing off the walls. It can be hyper attuned, hyper learning. So if our bodies are calm and relaxed, and our processing is calm and relaxed, because we've practiced being in an alpha state, the concentration area, but then we bring in hyper concentration, and we raise our brain levels to a level of processing that's so fast, surely that is where we're going to be able to receive large amounts of information. Now this is where I'm going to start mentioning the speed reading techniques. There are many, many weekend conferences that teach you how to speed read and you go to them and you think great and then you go home and you find they just don't work. And there are other techniques that tell you how to sort of read words quickly and process them and they're effective to a certain area. But they also have their limitations. But if we combine those with a hyper mental state, this is where our brains can quite easily be processing 600, 800, 1000 words. A minute. Now, if you think world champion speed readers, I think the world record is about 4,500 words a minute. What brainwave level state do you think that person is? Now, I'm not saying everybody is going to be able to read at that speed. That person is incredible, they practice and hone their skills. But where do you think their brain is going to be to be able to process information at such a high rate? Of course, it has to be in a gamma state. So, therefore, when we're talking about brainwave states and learning, we have three key states we need to bear in mind. And this is very, very, very important. Not for accelerated learning, because accelerated learning is accelerated, but it's not super learning. And anyone claiming they're teaching super learning and isn't talking about these specific things doesn't really know what they're talking about. They know accelerated learning, they might be selling it as super learning, but they're teaching accelerated learning. And accelerated learning does work and it's very effective. But if you want to become a true super learner, you have to understand these things. We have three brainwave states that are going to be highly effective. And we're going to look at tools and techniques to help you master these states and to help you get into them when you're learning. So we have, first of all, the alpha state which is a calm, concentrated state where our brains can focus and process information visually and very effectively. We have the delta state. That is highly effective when we get used to it. 
for processing information, the higher level delta states, because we do want to be able to keep that visualization process in there, along with the feelings and the sensations of the information. And then we have the hyper, the gamma states, where we can process information very, very, very efficiently and effectively. Now, when I'm talking about all of this, am I talking about, again, accelerated learning, which is a conscious processing of information? Again, highly effective technique. But super learning requires subconscious learning. Alpha can be conscious. Delta is more subconscious. And gamma mixes conscious and subconscious processing. Now, which is going to be the most powerful? Conscious by itself? Subconscious by itself? Or mixing the two together? This is super learning territory. To put the information in. To get the information out, then we do want to be alpha. But to put the information in, we want to be in gamma states. Again, we're going to go into this more later. Let's come back to the example most people have experienced in their lives. Most people do it from young age and older ages. This is why it's a very good topic to look at. And many people tend to think it's one of the hardest things to learn. Languages. If you can process information, information consciously on an accelerated system, then, as they say, you can learn a language from zero to fluency in six months. If you're using a combination of accelerated and super learning techniques, how fast could we get there? Another thing with languages is, using the accelerated techniques, they do tend to use visual stimulation. And they say, don't translate anything. And it's lots of vision and lots of vision and lots of vision. But hang on a sec. We already have a language in our heads. Think of bilingual people, trilingual people, quadlingual, quinlingual people. I know quite a few. And they have a natural ability to translate very, very quickly and say half a sentence in one language and half a sentence in another language. Are they translating? Well, yes and no. So whilst all these systems say translating is out the window, we mustn't translate when we learn a language, it's just actually not true. Direct translation, as I said, is not the system. It's passing it via an image, but it is still translating. So if we want to put a huge amount of information into our heads, and we're talking about language, so we're talking about something that is auditory, because at the end of the day, we can recognize what a car is because it's just a picture. But when we want to put that into a word, we have to go lingual at some stage. So language is a lingual, lingual process. If we combine the linguistics and imagery in a hyperstate and process that information subconsciously, doesn't that mean we can process information at huge speeds and become a super learner? So how do we learn subconsciously? There are courses out there, subliminal learning, learning whilst you sleep, learning under hypnosis. Do they work? 
Well, the learn whilst you sleep has been shown that it doesn't work. Because if you are asleep, you're in those theta waves. And that is not an area where you can process that information. Now, if you're in a light area of sleep, then it could technically be possible to process some of that information subconsciously. So that is why possibly this system is still around and still being sold today. However, when you're asleep, how are you going to control whether you're in a delta state or a theta state? Subliminal learning. Can we learn subliminally? Yes, we can, and it's been proven. However, when we learn subliminally, does the information go to our long-term processes? No, it doesn't. It goes to our short-term processes. And then a lot of the information, because it's only gone short-term, will be filtered out and forgotten. Because this is what we do every single day. We are receiving so much information that our brain processes. And let's come back a bit. Do we have freedom of thought? Do we have freedom of thinking? Or is that a combination of our belief systems, our filtering systems, and the information we're receiving throughout the day subliminally? Unfortunately, most people, unless they know exactly what they're doing and have been trained to lose their beliefs, their filtering systems, unprocess all their filters, be aware of all this subconscious information coming in. If you want to learn that, that is in, I know this might sound strange, but in my yoga course, because it's traditional yoga. If you want to learn about that, go and take my yoga course. But we need to be able to process this information and control the state we're in. So subliminally, it goes to short term, gets focused out, as I said, because we receive the information, we use that information, you know, the child walking past and, and then it's forgotten. We don't need to think about the immediate dangers we see around of the car driving past us very quickly. We don't need to re remember that six weeks later. So our brains filter it out. Learning under hypnosis. Does it work? Yes, this can work and it can work very effectively. Because what you're going to do when you go into hypnosis is put you in an alpha state. If they put you deeper, so the person doing the hypnosis with you has to be very good at what they're doing, then just taking a random hypnosis CD. If they are not clearly explaining where you're going, again, don't touch it with the barge pole because they're sort of guessing. And if you don't know you're going into that alpha state, that concentrated state to process the information, then you're better off just going in to the concentration state that we talked about earlier in the course and processing the information. So whilst hypnotic learning can be very effective and it can take the information directly to the long term, the person that's giving it to you has to know what they're doing. And the other problem with hypnotic processes is that let's say you're learning physics and you're putting this information in under type of hypnosis. Now what happens if they say a word that you don't recognize and can't process even in a hypnotic state. Well, unless they know, the person giving it to you, unless they know you don't know that word and give you the explanation there and then, again, it's not going to work. So therefore, again, by controlling yourself in that alpha state yourself, when you come across a word that you don't understand, then you can Check it, figure it out, make a definition in your brain, a visual definition for that word to then be able to use it. So again, theoretically, it's a great technique, but realistically, it's not all that powerful.
So what is the subconscious learning then? It's not subliminal. It's not hypnotic. It's not sleep. Well, it's... Again, I'm going to go to the languages. Learning to hear the information. Not listening to the information, hearing it and realizing that it is going into your brain rather than in one ear and out the other, and letting it go into your brain without consciously processing that information. I'll say it again. It's hearing. It can be hearing. It can be seeing. Not watching. Seeing something. Feel that what you're seeing and what you're hearing is being entered into your brain and then let it process. So we're not listening and we're not watching. We're taught generally to focus our attention and listen and learn. Watch the teacher, pay attention to them, listen to the teacher, etc., etc. No, this is all wrong. We want to hear the teacher and let the information into our minds. We want to see the teacher and let the information into our minds. Once it's in our minds, then if we want to consciously check it, which we will consciously check it when we're meditating, reflecting on it, that is subconscious learning. Subconscious learning can be done in an alpha state if it's slow, calm and relaxed. And it can be done at super speeds if we're using gamma. So I keep mentioning these two levels. Which is the best one for learning? Is it better to hyperlearn or is it better to regular speed learn on an alpha level? Why do we have to choose? Would it not be better to process the information twice, subconsciously, one in a gamma state and one in an alpha state? So we have two levels of subconscious processing, subconscious receival of information. So it's going to do stuff in our brains that's slightly different in both states. If we cover both, that's when we can get super learning. So it's not necessarily listening to something just once and we've got it. Perhaps we have to listen to it twice or see it twice. I said listen to it twice. Hear it twice. And perhaps we have to see it twice one in each state. And then the processing starts. The reflection starts. Now to be able to get to these levels, is it just, ah, oh, okay, I can sit back and relax. I've learned how to get my brain into a gamma state, sit back and relax, and it'll all go in and brilliant, done. Well, mm, if only it were that simple. There are some techniques we have to learn consciously and process consciously. So we become consciously conscious of these processes. Practice these processes until we can do them unconsciously. So, and conscious consciousness turns into unconscious consciousness. So we practice these skills 
consciously because there are some things that are better done consciously. And once we practice them and we've mastered them, mastered them means we can process them subconsciously, then we can use these tools together with being in a gamma state and then an alpha state to receive that information and become super learners. These techniques are accelerated techniques. So it's a combination of accelerated learning and super learning, which is going to create, we can call it if you want, hyper learning. So how do we learn? Well, evolution has given us five senses. Visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, and gustatory. Visual, using our eyes. Auditory, using our ears, kinesthetically. Feelings, emotions, motions, muscle memory. Olfactory, our smell, gustatory, our taste. Now the primal senses are of course, gustatory and olfactory when it comes to memory. They are going to be the most powerful things we have. Babies recognize their parents, first of all, by smell. We learn something's poisonous by possibly taste. Not necessarily poisonous, but it's not good for our bodies because we receive, we taste something, don't like it. Normally when we don't like it, there's a reason for it. And smells, we smell something, oh, that doesn't smell good, or mm, danger in the air. But we can't really smell our vocabulary. So it's not the best one to use, and we can't really taste our vocabulary. So it's not really the best one to use. Yet we can for certain things. But the main ones we're gonna use are visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. Kinesthetic, when can we use kinesthetic learning? Well, obviously if you're learning a dance, or learning to play football, or learning any sport, um, if you are learning to do postural yoga, then obviously there's going to be a lot of kinesthetic sense in there. But when we're learning academically, the two main academic systems are going to be visual and auditory. In schools, most people learn the auditory. Yet, if you think about it, you can process up to, what, three, four words a second, where visually you could actually process about 40 or 50 words a second. So which is more powerful? Why is a picture worth a thousand words? When you want to think of a memory. First of all, you normally get feelings and emotions, or perhaps you get an image first, and very closely combined with feelings and emotions, the kinesthetic. But those voices don't come in till at least that point. Even if I ask you, what does your mother sound like? you will process mother and get the image of your mother or a mother far faster than you start hearing the voice. The primary sense involved in learning is visual. Therefore, to speed up our learning, and this is what accelerated learning is built around, is using visual techniques. When we want to put certain things into long-term memory immediately, we then want to combine 
in our head those images we made with feelings and emotions, and then possibly we can put in smells and tastes. Going back once again to the language learning. Chocolate. Chocolate. Smell. The chocolate. Taste. The chocolate. See. The chocolate. Touch. The chocolate. Eat. The chocolate. How does it make you feel when you're eating it? Putting the information in, it's going to be visual. Creating connections to increase stimulus for memory recall, we're going to use the top ones. If we want to then also add in sounds, they can be very, very, very powerful too. I'm not going to say that auditory is a bad memory sense. No, it's, again, it's one of our primary senses. It can be very powerful. So if you want to think about getting up at six o'clock, you can program your internal clock feeling. I'm going to wake up at eight o'clock in the morning. You see your alarm clock flashing eight o'clock. You put a meh, 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 meh sound for eight o'clock. And you connect that to your internal clock. If we want to, we can add a smell of coffee. See if you wake up at eight o'clock by doing that. So the primary learning sense has to be visual. And as I said, accelerated learning is what this teaches. So we have to make images. Now these images can be still images and they can be movies. Which is better between a still image and a movie? Well, it's not necessarily better or worse. However, if you make a movie, we do need lineal processing to recall a certain part of that movie. So if it's a very short movie of two or three seconds, to get enough information in to remember what we want, that's fine. But if we're, for example, reading a book and we make a movie of the entire book, if we want to go to chapter four, we've got to make sure we either make stills to enter in chapter four, or we've got to run very quickly. It doesn't take long, it only takes a couple of seconds, but we've still got to run through linearly to get to chapter four. So if we do make movies, it's far better to make short movies with stills at the beginning of each to be able to process and find that information quickly. Or we can just use stills, flashes of information with lots of information in there so we can process and we can add image here, image here, image here, image here, image here. And we can see them all and we can process. When we are going to make images in our mind, this is one of the most important things and one of the things that most people get wrong when it comes to learning. We're going to learn again, yet yeah, let's use the language, let's use Spanish again. Aeroplane. Have you got a picture of an aeroplane in your mind? Right. Connect to that image the word Avion. Av, ion, avion. Is it there? Let's improve this slightly, shall we? Aeroplane. Let's make it a cartoon aeroplane who's singing and laughing and smiling and walking along on its wheels 
and having a dainty time and possibly drinking a cup of coffee. And it's big and bright. Maybe it's pink and purple and blue and orange. Avion. And now we're going to write in our image avion. AV. Let's put the AV made out of chocolate or plasticine or aeroplane wheels or clouds, however you want to put them in. And after the AV, we're going to put a little dot in there. And then we're going to put ION, ION, in something else, in a different colour, made of some another sub substance. Avion. Have you got the word in the image? OK. Now, of the two images that you had, which one stands out? The second one, right? Now, why did I put that dot after the AV before the ION? Well, again, a written word in two-dimensional black letters is very hard to remember. But if we can create an image of that written word, doesn't it make it far more powerful? We can use other tips and tricks to do this. Some people say they're great. Some people say they're not. And they will actually hinder you when you become more advanced. What are these techniques? Well, Avion, what we do is we think of an English association with that word to make another image. So, for example, we have, let's think about it, avion. What, how can we make an English word, eon, iron? Yeah, av, have. So we could have an aeroplane doing the ironing. Avion? But is it avion, avion, avion? Unless we can get this very, very specifically for the pronunciation, the correct, correct pronunciation, this can cause problems. And that's why some people don't like this system. Now, I'm not going to say which is the best system to use because each person is different. Then they can take eon out of an iron. But other people will start mistranslating it, etc. Long term, the better system is the av.ion in phonetical languages and if we have mastered the alphabet of that language. If it's not as phonetical, then I agree the other system is going to be highly helpful. So it's not there's one system for everything. We have to adapt things depending on what we want to learn. Flexibility and imagination are the other keys to super learning. I didn't say this previously, but what was the aeroplane we just made? Which one are you thinking of? The smiling one drinking coffee, or perhaps doing the ironing, or the plain boring aeroplane that you first thought of? Imagination is key, and these are things we have to start processing consciously before we get into the subconscious learning. Opening up our imagination, learning to make things bright, fun, playful, happy, sad, stimulating emotionally to create a way for our brains once mastered this system to process subconsciously this new system very, very, very quickly. So right from the word go, we're going to start practicing creating pictures. There's a big movement currently 
again with flashcards, using flashcards to learn new information. Flashcards have been around for a very long time, but they're coming back into fashion again. And with the creation of apps like Anki, that it gives you pictures or you can create your own words with visual images and then you practice and it gives you timings and everything. Whilst very powerful for conscious processing, the problem with these images that you're going to be able to get, even if you draw them yourself, if you draw them yourself, it's going to be far better, but you've got to draw it yourself. It's going to take quite a while. You're then going to have to take a photo of it and then insert it into Anki. Or you can use Google searches to find images online. But those images online, are never going to be as powerful as the images you can create in your head. So these tools can be good backup plans. And the Anki tool, I do use it as a backup plan when I am checking memory recall for myself. Because, for example, when I'm learning something new and there's an image, I, I have an image in my head, so let's go back to the aeroplane. But let's face it, in the world, not all the aeroplanes are standing there having fun, walking on its wheels, drinking a cup of coffee. They are regular aeroplanes. And I need to be able to process everything together. So if I use Anki with in my vocabulary list, a regular aeroplane. That regular aeroplane, what I would want to do with that is then translate it to my fun image in my head to then get avion. Because I can see the letters underneath. Or because I have my aeroplane ironing, whichever one you want to do. But so, whilst Anki is a great additional tool to stimulate memory recall. Check it out. It's a free app for Android. I think it's a paid app for Apple. But go check it out. It's a very powerful extra additional tool to recall information. And it's very useful for when you're sitting on the train and you're not feeling highly imaginative and highly stimulated to, to be seeing all these images in your brain and to make sure that you don't forget a word let's say you've got a hundred words to learn and you can only at that point remember 50 well with Anki you're gonna have the hundred words in there and so you're gonna go through them all and you're gonna relate those images to the fun images you've created and then you get the word so is a very powerful tool A-N-K-I Check it out, not for learning, but for recall stimulus purposes. A lot of people say use flashcards for learning. And again, this is where they're mistaken. Flashcards, whether they're SRSs like Anki, timed recall, so you can look at them. You'll find Anki is short and sweet. You do a couple of minutes and move on. It's not a long process, little and often. Or whether you make your own physical flashcards and you use them little and often for memory recall. So many people sell these as a learning tool. They're not a good learning tool. Well, they can be a good learning tool. They can accelerate your learning slightly. But they're not accelerated learning and they're not super learning. They're just very useful for memory. Recall. If you take a language you know nothing about, have no idea whatsoever, and you try and use Anki flashcards or whatever type of flashcard, you're going to get frustrated with it. it, it it's going to have its problems. Yes, you can stick with it, you can be, but let's face it, most people don't. If you have some idea of that language, maybe you learned it at school, more or less, and you've 
got it over the years type of thing, and so you could use it to help you recall the memories that you still have stored in your brain. That's very different. But primary thing we have to start practicing. Create images in your head, fun, bright images. How are we going to do this? It's, it's very simple. Take 10 words in your own language that you know and create some images. Banana. What you got? I hope it's not a boring yellow banana. I hope it's a happy dancing, singing, running around banana. Perhaps it's pink. Cloud. What's your image? Is it fun? Is it bright? Is it entertaining? Perhaps it's not a fun image. Perhaps it's a rude image, an explicit image. They work very well too. Maybe it's a violent image. Any extreme emotion will work. Got your cloud? Tortoise. Got one? Is it a giant tortoise? Is it a tiny tortoise? What colour is your tortoise? Is your tortoise jumping over the moon? Imagination. Have fun with these images. Car. Bike. Neighbour. Cat. Etc. And just practice making good, fun, clear, bright images, explicit images, violent images, disgusting images. Have fun creating them. Go through and create a minimum of 220. 220 words in your own language. It doesn't take long to do. It might take you yeah, 10 minutes. And then just practice the recall after an hour, after a day, after a week, after a month. Check whether they're there. Check whether you still got the images. If you've created good enough images, they will still be there. It's that simple. It's that powerful. If you can't remember them, it's because your image wasn't good enough. Now, why are we going to do 220 words? Well, 220 words, that is the amount of time it takes to be able to pass our conscious efforts to our subconscious brain. And if we do it in a really easy step-by-step -step method with stuff we know, just practicing an imagination game, it's going to be far quicker and far easier to process it in. Now, in those images when you're making them, let's also practice putting the word in three-dimensionally, works better, into the image with a dot in a certain place. Now, do you put that dot in a phonetical point or if you want to, you can, it's not necessary. You'll find your brain will probably want to do that. If it doesn't do it, perhaps you're dyslexic and it doesn't do it naturally. Over time, it will happen by itself, so you don't need to force it. Do it after the video, before you play the next video, have some fun. The next video, we're going to do a little test of 20 words that we're going to remember in order. And we're going to see how well we do. By having practiced this first, your results are automatically going to be better than they were before you did it. So perhaps to get a full awareness of this, you don't want to do the 220 words, you want to do the next video to see what your memory is like now, or you can take 20 random words and try and remember them in a list. Any 20 words, doesn't matter, random, try and remember them, give yourself two minutes to remember them and see if you can. And then create these fun images of these 20 words 
and see how well you remember them, just to give yourself a little comparison. But in the next video, we're going to look at learning 20 words and linking the 20 words. If you've got a good imagination, then you might already be figuring out exactly what we're going to do, and that is brilliant. And congratulations if you're already trying to figure that out for yourself. But in the next video, we'll see how to do it. So, think of your 220 words or not. Watch the next video and then do your 220 words.